A big thank you to the Talk Python team who sponsor this episode of the podcast. If you want to get better at Python, now is an excellent time to take an online course. Whether you are just learning Python to delve into great topics like artificial intelligence, or you need to go deep into things like APIs and async, my friends at Talk Python Training have a top-notch course for you. Visit talkpython.fm mind to find your next level and get a 10% discount. Also a big thank you to all my patrons who support the Engineered Mind podcast. Hi and welcome to the Engineered Mind podcast. In this podcast we cover topics such as engineering, artificial intelligence, neuroscience and other interesting topics to educate, inspire and engineer people's minds all around the world. I'm your host Josef and in today's episode I'm very happy to welcome three guys from the Mu Zero Hyperloop team of Karlsruhe on my podcast. The team captain Leonhard Döring, the division leader of continuous development Lars Onemust and the head of technology Olaf Dünkel. Their vision? A journey from Munich to Hamburg in 45 minutes with a Hyperloop which takes seven hours by train, enabled by extremely low friction caused by the low pressure in the tube the Hyperloop is in and the levitation mechanism that makes the pod float. Musery is a group of students from Karlsruhe, Germany, who are convinced that the Hyperloop concept could change our way of moving forever. They want to face the technological challenges and pave the way into a new era, the era of zero friction. Ladies and gentlemen, and now here's my discussion with Leo, Lars and Olaf from the Musery Hyperloop team. So welcome guys. It's a pleasure to have you on my podcast. So today we want to talk about the Hyperloop in particular, especially the new team that you founded at KIT. But before we get started, maybe each of you can give us a one minute bio of maybe who you are and what you do and what your role is in the Mu Zero Hyperloop team. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for having us, Yusef. Uh, my name is Leo. I'm in my eighth semester uh, of a bachelor's course of mechatronics engineering at KIT. And uh, I'm currently the team captain of Musero Hyperloop. I founded the team together with uh, with Olaf, and um, yeah, we're pretty excited about the upcoming season and what we're going to achieve. Awesome. Yeah, so maybe I just uh, continue. My name is Olaf, and I'm studying electrical engineering. I'm in my first master semester, and yeah, I'm kind of responsible for the technical organization. And right now, I'm working a lot on the concept for our propulsion and levitation system and yeah I'm, I'm looking forward for the upcoming months and yeah will be exciting for us i think we all are i'm Lars. i'm studying mechanical engineering in my first master semester at kit in my bachelor i actually did a bit of um working with interface because i think um it's really be interesting to get a diverse knowledge in different topics but a bit of material science a bit of uh uh, AI and now I'm settled here at Hyperloop and I'm really um, excited about what we are going to do in the next year. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Could maybe one of you or maybe if you want to talk about it like every every one of you, maybe start if someone clicks on the podcast and doesn't know what a Hyperloop is. Can you explain maybe in, in layman terms what is a Hyperloop? Basically, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, the, the main idea, the core idea is that you have a capsule uh, that is filled with like 50 passengers and the capsule uh, will drive or like in best case will float, levitate through a uh, partly evacuated tube um, and with, with very high speed. So we're talking about like um, Mach, <laughs> I don't know the English word actually, about the uh, um, velocities of like 800, 900 kilometers per hour. Mm -hmm. Got it. So why did you even start a team like that at KIT? Because we didn't have a team like that before. Of course, we had uh, car racing, the racing team, of course. But why did you start, decide to start a Hyperloop team at KIT? What was your motivation, your idea, your spirit? Well, it's a, I guess it's an interesting question because um, yeah, me and Leo, we were we, we did an internship together and we were living together. And yeah, we had long discussions and yeah, a lot of communication during our time then. And yeah, Leo told me about that um, the team Munich, they have a great Hyperloop team. And he even was wondering whether he should take, per, uh, whether he should participate in, in the Hyperloop team of TU Munich. Um, but then we discussed a little bit about it, that it's not uh, always about just uh, participating in something. It's it's all, uh, also about um, starting something anew. And as you said in Klaus, there was no Hyperloop team before. And we just said, oh, why not? Why not initiating something like this? And 
yeah, so that was uh, the starting point, I guess. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so, of course, you're currently just bringing the team together. And how 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 did how did the beginnings go? Like because you, if you start something, if I think about Elon Musk for example, if you start th something, I mean the idea is quite simple, right? But how do you want to approach this big project? Uh, how do you? Where do you see like the downsides, but also the advantages of starting an own team instead of joining a team? What would you say? Maybe last, <laughs> if you want. So so on first hand, uh, it's difficult to join a team here in Baden-Württemberg. So. Uh, <laughs> We had to found something new and also it's a really good opportunity to get uh, practical knowledge during our studies. That's something all of us um, noticed during our bachelors mm -hmm. that uh, our studies are quite theoretical and uh, everybody um, wanted to do something that helps our society basically. And starting Hyperloop as a student team is uh, necessary as we think because it's such a complex system And it's nothing that will be achieved by one enterprise or one company that founds uh, that will be founded and then has an idea and then it will work because you have to work in interdisciplinary teams and that's what we are excited about. Mm -hmm. Makes absolute sense. And of course, Hyperloop as a as an entity as a whole is quite simple to understand. But of course, you have to subdivide it into different modules. Maybe you can explain what you decided, where the modules, and how do you want to tackle each module separately um i think in in first year it's kind of of course there is like um the, the capsule itself the pod as it is also called sometimes mm -hmm. um so this is like one module that you have to think about um it's basically not that difficult to to build a pod um the the whole thing the whole infrastructure around is way more complex like uh, the tube or also the like train stations they are uh, sometimes called portals um, and these are way more difficult, especially to embed them in the, into the existing infrastructure and everything. So um, in first year, uh, as to like building all this, the startup culture, the, like all the um, technical infrastructure with offices and all that the things that have to be done, we really want to focus on the pod, on the capsule to have something to, to work on, to have something as a basis. And then in the upcoming years, we're really trying to focus also on the scalability, uh, on the infrastructure and architecture that might also um, be extremely important uh, for the whole concept. Mm -hmm. Olaf, last, do you want to add something here? Or? I would say um, uh, starting with the pod is a good choice because it's, it's not the simplest component, but it's easiest to manufacture and to achieve as a student team because building a Hyperloop track is not that easy. And also many mechanical, electronical and mechatronic challenges of the Hyperloop lay within capsules because this is where the people will be during the transport. Yeah, and absolutely true. And maybe I can mention uh, one more point. Uh, basically, we, we, we heard also about the, the Hyperloop concept uh, uh, when, when um, considering the SpaceX Hyperloop pod competition. And there, like the, the track was given, and what the students team what they have to do is to to develop the pot and to do like yeah pot capsule de development, and so that's a starting point for a student student team like us. Uh, we we have like the infrastructure that was that is um like basically developed by the um, SpaceX, and it's up to us to develop the capsule. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and, and it's also more like, like Leo said, it's more manageable for us to develop first, like a, a similar system, like a, like a racing car, maybe in terms of dimensions, and that's um, more manageable, yeah, easier manageable, mm -hmm. like uh, building up the whole system. Yeah. Talking about the size of the Hyperloop, uh, do you know what the restrictions are in terms of competition? How big can the Hyperloop be? Because I'm not an expert, and maybe you know more about that th than I do. Oh, what kinds of competition do you mean? Do you mean like uh, students' competitions, exactly, like the yeah. SpaceX one? Yeah, yeah uh, it, ha it has actually, uh, the SpaceX rules have um, 
kind of loose requirements because uh, you can build a pod in between like 1.5 meters. It's like, uh, it's it's a very uh, un odd number. Uh, and you can go up to like 7.2 meters, something like this. But we are trying to keep everything as small as possible in first year because it's it's way easier to build a downscale prototype. Um, every mechanical, every mechanic part uh, will, will get way easier that way to manufacture and also to carry later on. Mm -hmm. What would you say are the biggest challenges when developing or prototyping a Hyperloop? Is it more, because there are so many, so many trade-offs you have in terms of aerodynamics, also mechatronic systems. Maybe you can talk about that in particular. I think it's very interesting. The Hyperloop uh, is actually a highly, uh, a highly complex mechatronic system because you have a lot of subsystems that have to um, coexist inside the pod and all have to function properly in order to achieve these high speeds uh, in this uh, low pressure environments. So for example, you will have a suspension system, probably a traction suspension system, then you will have a levitation system, and you will have um, a cooling system that all have to be managed within um, these uh, environments. And that's really complex. And the interaction between these components has also to be managed. It's nothing that you can just say, I'm doing suspension system, then I will test it, and then I can integrate it, and it will work. Because uh, because of these interactions, you have to um, design everything together. It's nothing that you can um, divide and conquer, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Fred, you want to say, yeah. Olaf, talk, please. <laughs> yeah, so maybe one, one aspect uh, regarding the, the Hyperloop. So, um, it's definitely the complex structure in itself that everything is connected to each other. But it's also that um, it, it definitely depends on the concept you're trying to um, pursue. Uh, but um, for example, if you want to realize a levitating um, uh, pot, then it's, it's, there are some um, technological um, challenges um, which are special to, to this system. And so I guess one of the major challenges in terms of technology and, uh, yeah, um, what what has to be accomplished and which yeah, a lot of concepts you have to consider is the levitating concept because it's it's like it's not normal that the uh, yeah capsules are levitating and flying there <laughs> there it's it's no actual uh, like suspension system where you can just uh, roll on the uh, on the track actually this concept uh, has been known since the early nine uh, 1900s <laughs> so it was always thought about, but it, it was always too complex to tackle. Mm -hmm. And maybe to add, you um, have to consider a lot of other things. Uh, one part is the technology, but the other part is also you have to get it into existing laws because other modes of transport transportation all already have patterns. You know what a technology is, but Hyperloop is a thing that nobody ever did. So you don't have a foundation you can work from. You basically have always to start from scratch. If you want to design a port, the track, or the Hyperloop system as a whole. Mm -hmm. It's good that you mentioned it also in terms of infrastructure. Um, I don't want to go too much into politics, but do you have any idea how politics, are they very supportive in terms of building a Hyperloop? Because when we think of electric cars, it's kind of going very slowly. And the internet in Germany is not the best, as you know. So how do you see politics helping there in terms of, uh, especially the Hyperloop or like uh, the future itself? How do you see that? Probably the first two large restrictions. So um, you're limited in acceleration, what is allowed for um, person transportation. Mm -hmm. um, so if it's 1G, you can accelerate. That's uh, hard. And also you're limited actually by the maximal flight velocity that is allowed inside Germany. So any uh, mode of transportation has to be under, I think, 460 kilometers per hour. Mm -hmm. So that these are the hard restrictions. And then you have, of course, to work against the lobbies because you have to train um, manufacturers. You have, for example, the Deutsche Bahn. Everybody uh, wants to get a share of uh, transportation. And yeah, it's not like... Um, they would be keen to work on a new concept because it's basically something that could replace them, but it's not like we see it because um, Hyperloop will or have to act, um, act adjoint to all of these modes of transportations. 
Um, and then uh, there are also yeah, the political restrictions because you have to see that Hyperloop will have an environmental impact. You have to get more land because the infrastructure or the um, tracks can't be um, following the landscape as close as, for example, um, highways or train tracks because of the high speeds. And then for sure, um, the German bureaucracy won't help either. Will be a century long project, I think, before Hyperloop will be feasible on a large well, scale. Actually, actually, uh, on the other hand, the, the positive influence of politics is something like uh, basically the main problem that is always mentioned for a Hyperloop is the politics. So if you have a supportive uh, politician behind you, like the government uh, totally supports the Hyperloop, uh, you can get a lot of stuff done very fast, actually. Um, as we can see currently in, in um, the, the whole uh, Bavaria, uh, because the Technical University of Munich, uh, like I don't, I don't know. It's like one week ago they uh, they published that they uh, now have a complete research uh, focus point at their university, and uh, it's greatly supported by the whole um, state of Bavaria. So um, if there is a supportive government, you can definitely achieve. Of course, it's necessary that we have active pol politicians which are inter who are interested in in this topic because without having the support, it's actually not possible because at the moment it's it's too expensive for single companies to develop these um, yeah, the tools and the technologies to, to realize the Hyperloop system. And so it's absolutely necessary, maybe not even on a local um, regime, uh, like uh, even on a European scale, I guess it's, it's important that um, there are politicians which are, uh, who are active and support this. Mm, got it. But it's also a great opportunity for the European Union because um, the Hyperloop could uh, interconnect all major cities on our continent. It's something that's, that has never been achieved and it would be hugely beneficial for everybody. So like for example, then a track from here to uh, Paris would be probably under an hour and that's something that could bring the continent as a whole together. Mm -hmm. That sounds very, very optimistic. And I think everyone in the call now is very optimistic on the podcast because you started this project and I'm kind of a little bit of a part of the team. So that's very cool. So um, talking about maybe not the future, going too far into the future, but maybe talking about the next goals you have as a team. Maybe you can talk about the next steps you have in terms of Mu Zero Hyperloop. I mean, in the first place, we are really trying to, to build the first fu fully functioning pod. And this is kind of the, the first big goal for, for, for season number one. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what, what comes now is that we really think about focusing on one component um, of, the, of the Hyperloop pod. And we feel like um, the propulsion system is interesting, is very interesting. As many student teams are currently focusing on linear induction motors, we feel like this is uh, something that is actually um, viable. It was also proposed in the um, Hyperloop Alpha white paper by, by Elon Musk in two, 2013. Um, but we also feel like, as, as Olaf already uh, mentioned, we all also feel like the levitation is very interesting. And uh, we try to focus on both in first year and see whether we can um, come up with like cool and innovative ideas to, to um, you know, uh, have an innovative solution for, for both. Olaf, last, do you want to add anything here in terms of goals? <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe, maybe on the long long term, it's uh, we want to establish uh, like uh, maybe a Hyperloop community in Karlsruhe too, that um, people get active in this domain and maybe even in Baden-Württemberg. And yeah, we want to initiate maybe this a little bit by, by starting um, on the more like technological level first, as Leo said, and but also um, going into several um, communities and trying to to motivate to activate them. Yeah, I think what you guys do is super super cool. So uh, again, I have to say it's so cool to be part of it because you have so many systems and so many teams actually, and you can learn from each each and every one. Like you don't know everything, right? But you have a team which you can rely on, and you can learn from everyone. So that's kind of cool. So props to you that you decided to build a team in Baden-Württemberg. So that's very cool. So props to you guys. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Yeah. The, um, can you talk about why you decided to uh, 
build a student association instead of a startup? What are the benefits and maybe also disadvantages if they exist? Maybe you can can talk about that. Yeah, Lars already mentioned a few a few points of it. He he, he said that um, Hyperloop is a very new. Con of course, the whole concept is way older, but mm. uh, Elon Musk kind of re uh, put it into into media and and all that, like it, into the mind of everyone who's thinking about uh, high speed transportation. Um, but uh, the problem is that the whole like the whole infrastructure will be so huge that it takes a lot of time. And uh, as most companies of Hyperloop try to crowdsource their ideas, their their concepts, um, we feel like it's extremely extremely difficult to get a, a broad overview of the concept in first place by building a startup. We we don't have any foundation. So in first place, it's very very interesting for us to get to know the concept, to get to know maybe the critical points, um, things that have to be uh, have to be overcome. And then we can focus on one of those, and then maybe maybe we can we can build something on that. Mm -hmm. Got it. Last, you want to add, add something? I just wanted to add something to the economy of a Hyperloop company because the Hyperloop concept is nothing that will bring you profit in like the next years because it has to be developed. So it will really be a long-term strategy you have to adapt, and that's always uh, complicated with, for example, a startup. Because at some time you have to make profit to pay um, your employees, <laughs> and um, <laughs> doing it in a student team also enables us to um, see it from more of a research perspective. Because everybody uh, works on the concept because they are interested in it, they are excited about it, and this uh, is really something that we are looking forward to. Because everybody can bring in their personal ideas and this is something the hyperloop concept will need in order to um be feasible in the next years mm -hmm. that makes absolute sense yeah and um, will you work with like state-of-the-art concepts or are you already thinking about new concepts that you want to implement in uh, the mu zero hyperloop without giving away too much <laughs> <laughs> I'm, i might add here <laughs> Because last mentioned, uh, you did in your bachelor some some kind of AI related topics, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe you have some AI related topics in in mind that could help, for example, shape optimization for the Mu Zero Hyperloop might be one example. Maybe you have some ideas we that are, you want to share. For example, thinking about uh, some generative design, um, mm -hmm. incorporating uh, new uh, manufacturing techniques, for example, additive manufacturing will be something that we are looking into because it enables rapid prototyping, which will be really important in order to um, test the different systems quick and see if um, our design choices were right, because mm -hmm. you have to find a sweet spot somewhere um, where all systems work together. Mm -hmm. And that's really something that will change the industry in the next years with uh, additive manufacturing becoming more feasible every year. And that's something we want to participate in. And on the other hand, for sure, um, the digital revolution is here. And it's something that is, will be also really important because uh, the more complex your systems get, the less um, accessible everything is. So you won't have a nice analytical solution to everything. And then you have to get into simulation and uh, to iterate your systems faster. And it's uh, easier possible if you have a digital version of your system. And that's because we are looking forward to incorporating new ideas of um, engineering, for example, building a digital twin and adapting our tool change so they can adapt really fast to changes in different subsystems. Mm -hmm. That was a very smart answer without giving away too much. So <laughs> good job. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I feel like a topic that we have to talk about and uh, maybe Olaf, uh, maybe you want to talk about it is um, safety challenges. Maybe what safety challenges there are and what we have to take care of, or what are even the worst case scenarios when thinking about Hyperloop? Yeah, so basically Hyperloop, it's a, it's a low pressure environment, which which is like, as a human being, you can't survive kind of in, in such an environment. And of course, like the, the worst scenario is that um, our cop, uh, capsule is um, traveling through the, like the, um, the vacuum tube or the low pressure tube and then we get a leakage in our capsule and then our low pressure environment goes into 
uh, the like the capsule where the people are um, uh, sitting in. And yeah, that's definitely um, a big challenge mm. because yeah, probably you have to like uh, um, yeah um, open the, or like um, get air into the into the whole tube or something like this. So that's pretty much the, the um, biggest challenge. But of course, there are other challenges like that. There's a leakage at the um, at the tube, and yeah, there there have to be um, solutions to to tackle these challenges. Um, yeah, and I think that's not not a not a thing that um uh, that that could be solved or that can be solved in the next months. It's uh, up to yeah future um, or in the next uh, couple of ten yeah in decades maybe. Um, that people think about this and yeah solve problems mm -hmm. but in general um we we know um similar um challenges from um yeah from airplanes there we have also a low pressure environment so maybe one could use um experience from this the aerospace sector and apply it to the hyperloop domain uh, leo and last do you want to add something here in terms of safety challenges I, I have a point, but uh, Lars, if you want to, if you want to start, you feel free. I think. It's all right, all right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, what is actually also something that is um, considered a like crucial point to to always have in mind uh, is like environmental influences on the tube. So uh, when it comes to like earthquakes, when it comes to um, I don't know thunderstorms, all kinds of um, environmental changes that might affect the tube. Um, are critical, um, safety critical, and they have to always be kept in mind when designing the tube. And there is a lot of um, like effort going into from from civil engineers trying to figure out how the tube has to be um, built so that it is cheap on the on one hand. On the other hand, it's leakage safe so that the vacuum and the, the part vacuum part of vacuum stays inside. And the third point, of course, is that it withstands uh, the the environmental influences. And this is something that you always have to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Makes absolute sense, right? Um, I also want to talk about another topic, which is costs. Like maybe you have already yeah. done a cost estimation. I mean, if someone listens to the podcast, and maybe a team from, let's say, India wants to start a Hyperloop uh, team. And I think Elon also says competition is good, so I, they might be interested in this topic. So uh, <laughs> what, what about cost? Do you already have something in mind, what a, like a small or downscaled model would cost and what the scaled up model would cost. Do you have some rough estimate on that? Whoever wants to answer. <laughs> okay, uh, in the in the white paper, it, it, there is a very rough cost estimation and there is a lot of people arguing that uh, that cost estimation is uh, like realistic. Um, and the reason for that, of course, is there is so many uncertainties that you kind of have to figure out in first place um, so that it is kind of kind of impossible to to make uh, like very, very uh, specific cost estimation that is like correct on point. So um, what we're trying to do, of course, in first year before we started like doing full scale cost estimations is to really get into the concept first. So um, that is what we really focus on. And afterwards, in the upcoming season, we will pretty surely um, do a lot on that topic and uh, calculate more with the knowledge that we've gathered so far. But for now, it's, it's very, very difficult. I mean, I think every every Hyperloop company try to um, provide cost estimations, and I think they vary a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we already talked about this kind of coexistence between transportation media, like if we have airplanes, uh, of course Deutsche Bahn, who is like a big, big counter force, so to speak. Um, do you want to add anything else here in terms of like coexistence with other, let's say, cars, maybe pedestrians even? What would you say? What are the down yeah, downsides of that? Yeah, Olaf. Yeah, maybe one aspect about this is that the hyperloop, it, it, um, like it won't be, an, um, it won't um, replace other transportation modes. It's just a, another mode of transportation, which is probably like in uh, when we're talking about distance, like several one hundred, uh, um, several one hundred kilometers. Um, then, then it, it is an option, but it won't replace like cars because cars, that's a individual. Transport and transportation mode, and you need this transportation mode to be um, independent of um, specific infrastructure. 
um, but it can replace some some airplane transportation and it can replace some um, um, high speed railway transportation but it, it won't replace also e any um, railway transport transportation because you have to consider longer distances otherwise otherwise um, the concept doesn't um, solve a lot of problems if we are talking about like um, low velocities and yeah so so maybe to to sum this up and um, it will be a one more mode of transportation but no the, not the solution of mobility mm -hmm. are you saying Future that with mobility. yeah got it do you say that with full confidence or do you like secretly hope that hyperloop will maybe substitute <laughs> cars in the future actually that's that's with hope <laughs> um, of course so but but when we started we were um, not as optimistic as now i have to admit because yeah when we started there there are so many um like uh, how do you say so many people um criticizing the uh, the concept and the idea and of course there are still a lot of challenges that have to be tackled But um, when now now considering like uh, we 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 worked on this um, topic now for several months and we see that there's is so much going on and so many um, concepts are developed and they they concepts they like they they also um, feel or it feels like that they they, they could be an option that uh, yeah that sol maybe solves um, um, these kind of challenges. Mm -hmm. I think a collaboration is a big part of this whole because so much is going sure. on. And as you mentioned before our podcast talk that other teams are willing to share their knowledge, which is like incredible. Um, exactly. Have you have you thought about like creating something like a Wikipedia for Hyperloop in the future maybe? Of course, not giving actually, away too much, yeah. but actually bringing people to your team when we talk in terms of recruitment and growing the, the team. Actually, actually, when it comes to to a whole Hyperloop community, we feel like there is a lot of um, there is a lot going on in Europe already, um, and also all over the world. There is like different uh, kinds of communities. One of them is, for example, Hypermap. Uh, they try to get all the teams together into into discussions about the technological aspects of the Hyperloop, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of kind of um, like overall discussion, um, like conferences where you can go where you can talk to each other and, and have a lot of knowledge transfer and this is also something that we really want to contribute in the future um, to enable all the people who are willing to to contribute um, to do so and to to learn and get practical experience on, on the hyperloop concept but what is so so incredibly uh, motivating about the concept is that if you come up with a slightly new idea it's very likely that nobody has tried it before because it's the, the whole concept is so new and, and there's so few people working on it um, compared to like uh, like automotive industry or um, aviation industry. And uh, this is something that kind of keeps the pace up extremely for each and every one of us, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Um, do you think there are like other branches, for example, as you mentioned, automotive, where you can take ideas from several branches and implement them into the Hyperloop? Are there Definitely. other branches uh, which you can think of at the moment? Apart from the aviation industry? For I example, mean, or automotive uh, industry, like other branches yeah. that contribute. I mean, funnily enough, the automotive industry is kind of kind of interesting because of um, rotating asynchronous machines, because they are kind of the analog uh, analogous uh, system when it comes to linear induction motors that we're trying to build, as most of the student teams do uh, nowadays. Um, But the thing is that it's the, the hybrid concept is so highly uh, interdisciplinary. So it, we also uh, are talking about infrastructure. It's it's civil engineering. It's architecture, and you can take so much of like also logistics. All all that uh, all those branches um, you can you can take knowledge um, and you can merge it into into the concept, and that is kind of kind of. Uh, exciting i don't know it's super interesting yeah i, I think i have to agree because uh, maybe last uh, all of want to add something here but i just what? wanted to give a quick example um sure. because uh, when you uh see a hyperloop pod it's basically a combination on a small train on rails so you have um this branch then it will be about the size of a small bus so you have uh, the same safety regulations you have to comply with and then for sure it's flying if we're lucky And then you have uh, the intersection with the aviation industry. 
and for sure the safety um, factors and regulations will uh, somehow correlate with those in the aviation industry because it's a similar environment. Mm -hmm. But it's very cool to talk to you guys about that because uh, you're getting very enthusiastic during the podcast. <laughs> and I think people listening to that, they're very motivated. And maybe if they don't have a team nearby, they maybe want to start one by listening to the podcast. So I think that's that's a, that's a step in the right direction. Uh, last, you mentioned also the uh, levitation system. And uh, Leo, you mentioned the propulsion system earlier in the podcast. Maybe can, you can briefly talk about in layman terms, uh, how does the levitation system work? And after that, we want to talk about the propulsion system, how you imagined it to be or how to look like. Maybe you want to start with the levitation system. Who wants to mm -hmm. give his two cents on it? Yeah, so maybe generally speaking, there are several options how you could levitate. And one option that was mentioned in the um, white paper by Elon Musk is the air bearings. So you have uh, um, air um, like uh, at the bottom of your pot uh, flowing out, and then you have um, like a, um, a levitating force, so a upwards force. Um, that's one option. And at the moment, it's not uh, there's not a lot of research about this topic, but it's interesting. It's one option. Um, uh, there are also um, um, like electromagnetic and electrodynamic suspension. They are more um, like there's also there was research in, in the past already. And so the electromagnetic suspension, um, it's uh, for example, it's used in the Shanghai maglev train. And there basically it's that you have electromagnets which which magnetize ferromagnetic materials and because of that, you have attractive force. So you have attractive force between uh, the track and the capsule. And yeah, so um, where, when controlling this nicely, then you can have a levitating system. And secondly, there's the electrodynamic suspension. Um, that's about that you, you consider a, a timely varying magnetic field. Um, and this varying magnetic field induces so-called eddy currents yeah, and just uh, that's a, a kind of Maxwell equations playing around <laughs> at the final end. You get a you get a force in uh, upwards force, so a levitating force as well. Um, so it's a repulsive force, and that's maybe interesting about the electro or the EDS, how it's called. So sometimes the EDS system, the electrodynamics suspension, um, uh, it's it's inherently stable um, compared to the electromagnetic suspension. Mm, so maybe just in, in short short terms, if you um, have a higher levitation force, then your capsule goes up and then your magnet, like the, the air gap um, reduces the magnetic field, um, generally speaking, and then um, your force decreases. And yeah, you can imagine then it, 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 it's uh, getting to a stable state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what? maybe three options which are considered for okay. levitating. Cool. What is the um, big advantage, and, or, or, but also disadvantage in, compared to maybe contact related um, systems? For example, if you, if you think about a rail system, you know, a classical tram or like, what, what would you say is the levitation? Why, what is the big advantage of that system as compared to having contact like steel on steel? So uh, all of these systems basically aim to reduce uh, friction losses between the vehicle and the track. Mm -hmm. And it's highly debated if that's uh, really uh, going to be more efficient than a wheeled system. But the main idea is that many uh, losses scale um, more than linear uh, when increasing velocity. So at some point, your wheels will start spinning so fast that probably the bearings can't handle it anymore, mm -hmm. or that the uh, rolling losses uh, start to increase rapidly. And then your system won't be stable. You ca cannot manage it and won't be as efficient probably as using such another system. And uh, a way to counteract it would be po probably to increase the diameter of the wheels, but at some point it, they won't fit anyone in a tube. Mm -hmm. And then you have to um, get into new ideas how to um, yeah, propel or, and levitate or uh, interact with the rail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes absolute sense. So now we want to talk about the propulsion system. Who wants to tackle that? 
Um, uh, we, as, as I already as I already mentioned, uh, for us in first place, the linear induction motor seems highly interesting because it's not that difficult to mechanically build. Uh, when it comes to, for example, a linear synchronous motor, you need an active, um, or not an active, but you need a rail that covers um, like permanent magnets, which are not that uh, cheap, to be honest. Um, but uh, as everything is very, very unclear, which of them is the best choice for high uh, velocity transport, it's very interesting to just like pick one that you feel like uh, is probably feasible. And as we have seen in like many student groups, um, the linear induction motor seems kind of visible. Um, so we are trying to adapt that in first place to get some knowledge there so that we do not have to start completely from scratch. And uh, we are trying to um, link that to other um, like functionalities that a Hyperloop uh, might or might not have to um, have to show in, in the end. I don't want to, to dig deep, too deep into that, um, but uh, we are trying to build a linear induction motor in first place. This is kind of what we're aiming for. Yeah, got it. Super, awesome. Um, if people want to reach out to you, of course, if students from KIT listen to this by, by uh, serendipity, let's say, you're also looking for team members all the time. Uh, how can they contact you? And of course, I will put every information after the podcast <laughs> down in the description. Uh, that's uh, no no question. So how can they reach out to you? Well, we have basically, we have a, a website, uh, mu0.de. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you will put it in the description. Um, so, some people don't have to <laughs> type it. Um, but on the other hand, we also have, of course, email address, hyperloop at mu0.de. Um, or also contact forms on our webpage. Just feel free to to message us at any time. Uh, we are very pleased and happy about everyone who's motivated and uh, enthusiastic about the whole subject, um, the whole topic, because uh, we are uh, indeed, and uh, we really want to connect with each and everyone who, who has the same kind of passion. Mm, very motivating words from, from Leo. Um, of course, we want to talk about if someone wants to join, what, what do you think in terms of time management? Because of course you do it besides your studies, right? What would you say would someone have to work in a week roughly? Um, is it like 15, 20 hours? What would you say should someone spend in his uh, role when participating? We okay, think silence. that um, 50, 15 <laughs> hours is something that uh, can be expected because um, below this level, we also think that, e that the students uh, don't take much um, with them after a season. Yeah. Because then you're like a twangle between um, our project, your studies and other parts. So that's something that uh, would be great for sure. We have also um, small exercises for less than 15 hours a week. Um, we are planning to modularize the system so that uh, everybody who's interested can work with us um, starting from zero to five hours if they want to. It, it's highly dependent on what they want to do, what they want to do personally, what they want to learn, but we are open to everybody. And we are also planning on, for example, doing things like hackathons so that if you don't have the time during the semester, but you have a free weekend and want to dig in some topics, then uh, something like this would be a great choice. Mm -hmm. sure. And I think you're already in touch with uh, some institutes. So if someone wants to write their thesis about maybe a topic about the um, U0 Hyperloop, then they can also contribute to your team, but also like follow their studies, so to speak, like on, on in a parallel way, right? That's kind of the plan. It really depends on, on the topic that uh, one wants to write uh, about. Um, but we are currently a lot in touch with uh, the Institute of Technical Physics. Um, at, at KIT, we're also a lot, um, we're, we're communicating with the Institute of uh, Product Development and uh, Electrotechnical Institute. Um, but of course, it really depends. We have all different kinds of, of uh, people and students in our team. And um, we are always trying to reach out to the institutes that uh, fit best um, to whatever topic people want to write their thesis about. Mm -hmm. Sounds cool. That yeah, was yeah, maybe. Oh, sorry. No, 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 Olaf, keep going. Maybe one aspect about this. So at the moment, we are trying to develop a pod, but generally speaking, everyone who is interested in any topic related to um, the Hyperloop, it could even be superconducting uh, magnets and working on a levitating concept in this domain. At the moment, we won't be able to work on this, but if you're interested in like fancy topics like this, um, 
even then you you could um we could uh, work on a like cooperation with institutes um so it it will it, it's it's definitely um consistent what we are trying to to um like reach that um we are also working on a more like a research based level on the new hyperloop concept mm -hmm. That sounds like the podcast was very cool, guys. I have to say, I have to repeat myself. It's very captivating. If if I if we listen to you, like it's very, I'm very optimistic that you will achieve a lot, um, especially in this season, but also the following seasons. And as mentioned from the from the guys, I'll put uh, every link that's relevant for you, or if you're interested in Hyperloop in general, in the description. And I wish to do a second part with you in the future once you have the prototype, and then maybe we can film it like oh, yeah. on the campus. Mm -hmm that I'll come with my camera and film it on the campus and film the team a bit. Or maybe even the meetings. I really like there. that idea. That's cool. Yeah, I, I like that idea. I really like it. Okay. So cool. all, all of you guys, please stay tuned. Um, look a little bit into the topic. It's, it's very interesting. If you, if you feel like uh, high-speed transportation might be a thing in the future, and I'm pretty sure it will, as light, like the flight volume is rising year, year per year, um, feel free to always dig into it. Awesome. With that being said, thank you so much, guys. And with that being said, take care and see you soon on the campus, hopefully. See you. See you, Yusuf. Thanks for your time. Sure, absolutely. Bye. Okay. okay.